Fathers, dear faithful, we'll try to give you a summary of what we had to go through this last year, year and a half. It's a very interesting time, challenging. We had to go through a, a major trial in the society, and so there are many things to be to be learned from from that that time and that's very interesting from my position i have to experience more or less every year sometimes every two year one place in the society is subject to the attacks of the devil I use these precise words. It's not just a metaphor. It's a reality. You know, the Holy Scripture says that the devil is is turning around, is circulating, looking f- to divorce someone. And uh, indeed, indeed, the good Lord allows that uh, our work is well, will be tested by the devil. It's not just a normal or a usual trial. Problems, we have everywhere problems, that's normal. So that's life. Whenever you have people, well, you will have some problems, it's normal. But when it is a normal problem, you have a proportion between the cause and the effect and the reaction. So you have a problem, and then you have the people who react, react to this problem, and there is, there is a kind of proportion. And I may say, this is what we would, I would call a normal problem. When suddenly <clears throat> there is a total discrepancy between the real thing and the reaction, you see that the passions, that it's an explosion, it's like a volcano that goes in, in, uh, in the air, then you know, you know that this disproportion is caused by the devil. That's his way of acting. And so, as I say, from, it's almost every year, we have to experience one place in the society who has to go under a major, major trial. But just one place, one totally localized. Sometimes it is a seminary. Sometimes it is just one, one place. And the difference of, with what happened this time is that this kind of trial was extended to almost the whole society. And that's very, very rare. In all our history, we had two or three of those. So very few. But uh, once again, you see the same elements. That is, there is a problem, a real problem, but then the reaction is totally out of control. No comparison. And you see it's the passion, so it's blind. It's uh, violent. Uh, it starts to go in all, fuses in all directions. It's no longer the virtues who govern, but really the, well, the passion and sins and many kinds of (coughs) trouble and a lot of confusion. I may say the element uh, of that time was confusion. And it's interesting to reflect on this. Why was there confusion? The problem with this confusion is that some people have then lost the trust in the authority. And I may say that's a major problem. Because when you lose the trust to the authority, then you are left to yourself. Then you are alone to judge. And you can no longer rely 
on anybody. That's the great, great problem of, of distrust. That's what happened. Not everybody, of course, but uh, certain parts of the society went into that kind of situation. And once again, if you go back and look at the real reality, there is no ground. There is no ground. So many, many things that were spread around in the internet during that time were just simply false. False or even worse, the contrary of what really happened. If I look and try to see where does or did this confusion come from, you have several elements which did not help. The first, I may say probably the most deeper and the cause of all the others, is that we are experiencing since years a contradiction in Rome. I will try to develop that point because I think it's the major one. Since 2009, I am facing directly contradiction. That is, instances, authorities in Rome contradict themselves about us. The thing was so strong that in June, I requested a meeting with the Secretary of State, with Cardinal Bertone, because of that. Well, he did not give it, but he asked me to see Cardinal Levada, and I told him, I want to see you because, because you people, you are contradicting yourself about us. Some of you say we are excommunicated, we are out of the church. Others say, no, there is no problem, we are totally in order. It's a whole mixture there, and we do not, no longer know how to, to, to react with you, what to do with you because of this. I will just give you some, well, two examples. One, it was in 2009. It was just before Easter. In uh, beginning of March, no, even beginning of February already, uh, the <coughs> Secretary of State issued a statement saying, the society does not exist. And if the society wants to be recognized by the church, it's necessary that they accept totally everything. The council and all the teaching of all the popes since John XXIII to the, till the present. So no recognition of the society until they accept everything, all the novelties. Two weeks before Easter... We have a ceremony of ordination. It's called Sitientes. And this year, Rome did not want us to have them. They first started with Germany. In fact, it was the, the bishops in Germany who made the pressure. And so, one week before the ordination, Cardinal Castrillon is asking me, not to have them. First in Germany, he said it in a very kind way. He said, you would do a favor to the Pope if you do not do them because uh, there is pressure from the German bishops and so on. It was about Germany, not about the other places. So I talked with all the four bishops and we agreed to make a sign, to make a gesture but not to compromise. And so we say, okay, we're not going to have this ordination in Germany. But the subdeacons who should be ordained that day, they will be ordained. They will be ordained in Econ. And so two days before the ordination in Econ, Karl Castrion calls me again. And he said, you cannot have this ordination. It's impossible. You are against the Pope and so on. And then he said, here is what you have to do. You ask the Pope for the permission, and I guarantee you, almost immediately you will receive the permission, and up to the time of Easter, that is in these two weeks, the society will be recognized. 
And I told him, how so? There is this declaration from Rome which says we cannot be recognized until we recognize the, accept the council and you know very well what you think about the, the council. It's not going to happen. He answered, well, this text is only a political text. It is only an administrative. And by the way, that's not what the Pope thinks. So what shall I do now? I have an official test statement which says nothing with the society. I have a column who says, well, that's not what the Pope thinks. <coughs> you see, it's an example of this contradiction. Another one, 2010. We are in the discussions with Rome, and they treat us, I may say, as Catholics. Bishop de Galareta and the, pri the priest, they, they say the Mass in St. Peter in the morning. They celebrate the Mass in St. Peter, no problem. In September, a priest is joining us from the Novus Ordo. And he was a religious. And his uh, superior sent a letter to this priest with a letter from the congregation of the religious in Rome, who said the following. This father is excommunicated. He's excommunicated because he lost the faith by joining the schism of Archbishop Lefebvre. So I went down to Rome and said to Monsignor Pozzo, what's that? He told me, oh, we, we have already spoken with this. We have told to the congregation of the religion they don't have the right to say so. It's wrong. They are not competent, so they have to revise the judgment. And he made the sign in front of me. That's what you have to do with this letter. So you just... In the basket. So you have one instance in Rome who tells me to treat an official document from Rome this way. That's what I call also contradiction. I knew also, I know, I happen to know simply, that on the certain points where the Pope has done something favorable to us, you have other people in Rome who are doing sabotage against the Pope. Again, I'll give you an example, just that you may know that I don't speak in the air, but I have really these experiences. There is an abbey in Germany... This is the only Trappist abbey. And the Father Abbot asked the Pope not only to go back to the old Mass, because now it's allowed, he can do that, but to go back to the old rule before the Council. And the Pope granted it. And even said that he hoped that that's an example that would be followed by many. Now, six months later, this habit has not received any answer from Rome. And he's calling a friend in Rome, and he says, what's happening with me? This friend, who is very, very close to the Pope, told him, well, write again to the Pope. But this time you send to me the letter, and I will bring it to the Holy Father. Which happened. I know the story from that very person. So it's not just hearsay. Directly, this person who is very close to the Pope told me that story. So he went to see the Pope with his letter and he asked the Pope, what's going on with this abbey in Germany? And the Pope said, but it's six months that I have granted the permission. So what? They made an inquiry and in fact, it was the person in the Secretary of State who should have transmitted the decision of the Pope who had just put it into the drawer. This man now is Cardinal, the one who sabotaged the Pope. I know of the same person who did even another sabotage, well, he did many, he just hijacked a decision of the Pope 
which had to be transmitted to the prefect of the liturgy. So the Pope, you see, you have to understand how Rome works. When the Pope decides something, it does not go directly to the persons. It goes through the Secretary of State. So if you receive a letter from the Pope, it have, will have gone through the Secretary of State. If you write a letter to the Pope, it goes through the Secretary of State. There are some bypasses, but you, you must be well placed to, to get them. So in, it, in itself, it's impossible to get straight to the Pope. And even for the decision of the Pope inside, inside the Vatican, they go through the Secretary of State. And so you have people in the Secretary of State who just block the decision of the Pope and don't, not, don't transmit them. I, well, I have, once again, several examples of that. So it's something I know. So there are facts. This I tell you so that you may have a background of what is going to happen. So I know that the Pope would like to do something with us. I know that he's very attached to the Council. Very. During the audience in 2005, it was the point which was uh, impressed me the most, that was how inconceivable it would be, it was for the Pope to have a Catholic who would reject the Council. It was so strong that in the little letter which I wrote to thank him for the audience, I had to mention that I disagreed with him about the Council. To make really the point, say, no, we don't accept that. Okay. So, we have discussions. During two years, we have doctrinal discussions in Rome. These discussions, they were interesting, very frustrating, at least for us, for our people, because we really had the impression that they did not listen to what we said. They had just to defend the house, and that's it. And the end of the discussions were pretty hot because they told us, you are Protestants. And we answered them, you are modernists. That's the way the discussions finished. In, as a matter of joke, I said, well, we came to one point of agreement with Rome. And that is, that there is no point where we agree. Just to say. And so they know that. And Cardinal Levada is inviting me, it is in June, he's inviting me for a meeting in September, 14th of September. And he says, to evaluate, for an evaluation of the discussions. And he adds, and also to to evoke some perspective for the future. But clearly, the main topic will be the discussions, an evaluation of the, on the discussions. So we arrive there. About the discussions, they said, well, maybe it took three minutes, maybe five, but it was very, very short. What did they say about the discussions? They said, the discussions they have reached the aim. The purpose was fulfilled, which was for you to expose clearly your position. That's it. Is it good? Is it bad? Nothing. Just you were able to explain, to expose how you think. That's all. And then, then, proposal. We, Rome is uh, going to give you a canonical status and you sign this declaration. The name was Preamble. And what is in this preamble? More or less, 
every point which we would disagree, we had to accept. There was something in our direction, or maybe two things. One was to say, there is a legitimate discussion on certain points which make difficulty on the council. So there, is, there was an opening on discussing difficult points. And another one which, which would say, I may say that's the most tricky one. The most tricky. And really tricky. Because it says, on the points which are difficult, which make difficulty in the council, we follow the following principle. These difficult or confusing points must be understood, interpreted, in coherence with all the teaching of the Church throughout the ages. So you must understand them as the Church has always taught. And we reject any kind of explanation which is opposed to what the Church has always taught. You know, that's what we have always said. That's what Archbishop Lefebvre has said, always. We say, what is clearly traditional in the Council, well, we accept, we have no way to, to reject that. What is doubtful, we understand it the way the Church has always taught it, taught it, and what is opposed, we reject. So when you read that, you say, but that's what we said. Well, there was a little, little phrase which was added to it. And the little phrase said, as we find it, so we have to interpret, to understand the things, the, as the Church has always done, and so on, as it is done in the new catechism of the Church. Now there is a little problem there. Because the catechism, the new catechism, is precisely accepting all the novelties of the Council. And that's what we oppose. So in other words, they pretend now to do things as we do, and they do the contrary. Big problem. And so, so from the start, this text we could not accept. And that's what I told Rome. Can't accept. I told it even two times. First, I, the first time, I tried to remain broad because my aim was to demolish the frame which they were trying to impose to us. This frame is called the hermeneutic of the continuity that means that we have to interpret or to understand, or they pretend that the Council is in the line of tradition. And that's the only way you have to understand the Council in the light, in the, not only in the light, but to say that the Council is traditional. And we say, no, that's not true. We say that we should, that we should read, should understand Anything that comes from Rome in the light of tradition is the only Catholic way. But precisely this council, with this council, we can't do that because the texts are opposed to tradition. The contrary, what they say in the council has been condemned before. Especially religious liberty, but also ecumenism, for example, very clearly the contrary. And so we say, no, it doesn't work doesn't work. But I did not want to go into the details. I just wanted to, 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 so to say, to, to explode the frame. Because I said, if I go into the details, they will change the details, but they will try to remain, to remind, to keep the frame. So I said, no, it doesn't work. They were, they were not happy with it. And they called me and they asked if I could not be more precise. I said, okay, I will do it that, I will do that. And so I sent a second answer. It was not that I would correct the first. No, 
It was exactly the same answer, but more precise according to their text. So I sent to Rome a double no. Things seem clear, no? Well, the problem, the big, big, big problem I was facing there at that time is the following. Even before the 14th of September, I got messages from people who are working in Rome and which are friendly with us. People who have even burned, have been burned, their fingers have been burned because they were too close to us. And they work in Rome and they are our friends. And these people told me the Pope is going to recognize the society and he's going to do that the same way he did with the excommunication. That is, without anything from your side. Pope does it, done. And I got several of these messages from several different persons whom, let's say, authenticity I cannot put in doubt. For example, one of those was a person working in Ecclesia Dei, those who are dealing with us. And this very person, after we got the text, told us, that's not what the Pope wants. So you see, I got all these kind of messages which were not fitting together. I got an official thing where I clearly have to say no. And I got other messages which are not official, of course, but we say, no, that's not what the Pope wants. The Pope is much more inclined towards uh, you. And the people who tell me these things, they are not just someone in the Vatican. They are very close to the Pope. Very close. I mean, people who see him every day or every two days. And there are very few people who see him every day and these people, they know the Pope, they know what he thinks. And they give me this message. So what am I going, going to do now? I have an official message where I have to say no. I have people who tell me, but that's not what the Pope wants. You see, that was a major problem. So this is confusing. But the second problem I was in, it was impossible for me to say these things in the public. Because if I would say that, I would make things even worse. And, and Rome would say, that's not true. And even now, I expect Rome to say that, because I tell these things now. And if you think, what is Bishop Flay telling us? I will remind you of something which happened to me just a few years ago. It was with Cardinal Castrillon. Cardinal Castrillon told me the following. What I am going to tell you now, if you repeat it, I will be forced to deny it. You understand? Yeah, I tell you something, if you repeat it, I will say, no, that's not true. And he continued by saying, the Pope and myself, we are in your favor. But if, you te if he tells us that he's going to say the contrary, what can I do with it? Nothing. And just to remind you, that's exactly what happened with Bishop, Archbishop Lefebvre during his audience with the Pope Paul VI. Paul VI said to Archbishop Lefebvre, you oblige your semina seminarians to make an oath against me. And when Bishop, Archbishop Lefebvre said that in the public, Rome made a statement saying, that's not true. The Pope never said that to Archbishop Lefebvre. You see how complicated it is? So it's messy 
and you can't, you can't even say it. And if you try to say it, you make it even more messy. So that was, let's say, a part of the problem. Add to this, as people did not know what is happening, they tried to invent. And with the internet, wow! You have these things who go everywhere, and uh, the most r- wrong, right, false, true, everything mixed, impossible to make it, to correct it, and that was circulating in every place. People would say, Bishop Jolet told us this, Bishop Jolet did that and that, which were not true. Once again, I give you an example, just that you may, as you say, touch a little bit of these things. It was said on the internet, Bishop Fellet told to a priest of the society in Austria that in the agreement with Rome, every chapel which has less than three years of existence must be demolished. That's what the claim which you find in the internet. Now, the reality, what I really said to this priest, I said to them this, I tried to explain in our discussion with Rome, Rome told us we will recognize all the places, everything, every place where you say the Mass, we will recognize it as a Catholic chapel. And I told them, oh, fine, that's great, but I think we have one or two problems. For example, we have places, we rent a motel room to say the Mass once every two weeks. You are not going to recognize and to declare now this room of the motel a Catholic chapel. So what are you going to do with this? And so they reflect and say, okay, we could use the lunga data. It's a technical term. It means we will say every place where the Mass has been celebrated since three years. This place has a right to have a solid chapel. So if it, even from, from the time being it's not, you have the right to establish a chapel there. So that's what I told the priest. And you see what came out in the internet is exactly the contrary. It's crazy. Madness. But that's, that's an example of this, let's say, uh, problem I, I was facing. Now, to, to show you that it was, it was really serious, the messages I got, they were very serious, very precise. And well, I did not give you the names, but I give you one position. It is the secretary of the Pope himself. Closer to the Pope you cannot have who gave us these kind of messages. Example, Bishop Fellet must not fear. Once the agreement is done, he will be able to continue to attack everything as he does now. Attack all the errors inside, outside, doesn't matter. Another one, if the congregation of the faith is ruling against the society, the Pope is above the congregation of faith and he will, he will overrule it in, our, in, in favor of the society. Or other things like the Pope made, gave me a message. You must know that to solve the problem of the society is at the heart of the preoccupation of my pontificate. So something very, very important for for the Pope to solve the problem. To solve the problem means to recognize the 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 society as Catholic. And I know that the Pope knows that we oppose the Council. So how how do we reconcile all these pieces? Well, the situation came to a peak a little bit later in March. In March, I will receive the answer from the congregation of the faith to my double no. I said no to them. 
And so I am called again to Rome by the Cardinal Levada. And the 16th of March, he gives me a letter. And he said, this letter has been approved by the Pope. Now I tell you, this letter, if I would have only this letter, would mean the end of our relation with Rome. Because this letter says, you do not have the right to oppose what the Church has taught yesterday with what she's teaching, teaching today. You cannot say that there are errors in the Council. And more, if you refuse the proposal of the 14th of September, which has been explicitly approved by the Pope, this means that in the facts you reject the authority of the Pope. And hence, there is a reference to the canon law, which they say the words you don't find in the letter, but the reference, yes, and this reference says, you are schismatic and you are excommunicated. And the letter continues by saying, but the Pope, in his goodness, he wants to leave you one more month to think about it. And if during this month you change your position, please let us know. That's the letter. Clear letter. I was going to say thankful to the good Lord, because now I had something clear in my hands. This clarity did not last long. The day before, and the same day, I got that message from Rome. Well, you're going to receive a very hard letter, but be cool. No panic. And two days after, the message was, the only thing you have to do with this letter is to put it into the archives. In other words, don't give to it any credit, any attention. Imagine, when I, I got that message, I said, that's crazy. And someone did report that to Rome, and the person who got that message in Rome, with a little smile, said, yes, that's crazy. It's so solemn, you, you know, from Rome, the this authority who says, I speak in the name of the, of the Holy Father. If you disobey, it's finished, done, too. At the same time, well, don't give any attention to that letter. It's unbelievable. How do you want me to tell these things outside? I say it now, but at the moment when it happened, I could not. It's clear that it was impossible. So what did I do? I did something you, in such a case, shouldn't be able to do. I shortcutted the congregation of the faith. If this message, which I get, I got, telling me don't give attention to that letter was not true. What I was doing here would mean it's the end. It's boom, the big explosion. Because if someone is a boss, is mandating someone to deal with you in a difficult question, and you disagree, and you try to bypass him, and to go straight to the boss, the boss is going to say, get lost. He's going to say, you have to go through the, the man I've given you. If you don't do that, you demolish his authority. And so I shortcutted the congregation of faith and I wrote another, a new letter, something new to the Pope. What I tried to do is, was something very delicate. I saw in the discussion of the 16th of March that in fact, if Rome was so hard against us, 
It was because they thought that we really reject absolutely everything since 62. Everything means the Pope, the Council, whatever they teach, they do, they decide, we reject everything. That was my understanding. They believe that from us. But that's not true. We, when we say that we accept the Pope as Pope and we pray for him, that's something real. It's not just a nice word in the, in the air. And so I tried to write a letter in which, first, announcing the principles of the faith and the magisterium, I tried to show them that. That in fact, even in the council, there are some things which we accept. But it is, it is a very delicate because there are things we accept, something we reject. And so to, to make this balance was very delicate. Anyway, after how much? Two weeks, I got the message from the Pope. Now send this same letter to the Congregation of the Faith, which means that he would have accepted it. And that's why at that moment you had the newspapers who said, well, there will be an agreement now, it's about to be an agreement, and so on and so on, which has never been true. Why? Because, first, this text, which seemed to be more or less accepted, finally will not be accepted. That's the first point. And secondly, much more important, I have always, from the start, said to Rome, we are glad to be recognized by the Church, but there is one condition. And this condition is that we are accepted as we are. And to be accepted as we are means that we continue to do what we do. That we continue to learn or to teach what we do. That we continue to attack what is wrong, the errors. That we continue to have our liturgy, the old way. And I said that's a condition... Well, I just quoted Archbishop Lefebvre, in fact, because he's the one who said that, and I just gave, gave the quote, condition sine qua non of a recognition by Rome. And so, at that moment, when I hear the Pope seems to be satisfied with my, my letter, I wanted absolutely to verify the second point, which was, for me, more important, are we or not allowed to continue to attack? And I made an extra trip to Rome to verify that. It was in May. And during this meeting, I saw that the Congregation of the Faith, in fact, they wanted to correct my text. And so I sent a letter to the Pope and to Cardinal Levada saying, you change one word, finished. Now you have the meeting of the cardinals who study my text. Cardinal Levada at the beginning and at the end of the meeting will say, we don't touch the text. You have the cardinals who express themselves. You have a vote. The vote is one abstention and all the others in favor of the text. And nevertheless, when I get the text in my hands, it is changed. And all the things I had kicked out because I cannot accept them, they put in again. What happened? What happened is simple. As I was not happy with the answers they gave us when I said, can we continue to attack? I made a test. I published an interview in Dici. It was the beginning of June. And there, 
I speak about the errors of Vatican II. And I speak about, let's say, the, how do you say, how bad the new mass is. And they used that. They went to see the Pope with this interview. And with this, they made the changes in the text. I know that precisely for two reasons. And the second reason is that when I was called to Rome on the 13th of June, they had my interview in their hands. And they said, you cannot say that there are errors in the council. You cannot say that the new mass is bad. And I also know that Lombardi brought the, the, the text to, to the Pope. And that they had the whole Friday afternoon the, from the Congregation of the Faith with the Pope. And they discussed that. So that's why when on the 13th of June I receive this corrected text, I don't need one minute of reflection. And on the spot I say, I'm not signing that. A few hours before, because I get that, that letter, the meeting is at 5 in the afternoon. A few hours before, the head of the Freemasonry in Rome says there will be no agreement. That means the Freemasonry knew about these happenings. I cannot say more. I just say what I know. I know also that the state had prepared a counteraction which would be a breach of relations with the Vatican, if the Vatican would have recognized us. And it's a big state. Several bishops' conferences had prepared also counterattacks. Precisely, the German speaking, they had prepared something which in which it was clearly declared that they don't want to have anything to do with us. And if possible, they request that we leave the country, that we close all our chapels, churches there, and remove all the priests. That was the plan from the German-speaking countries. Against the recognition by the Pope, you have to understand, if the Pope would have recognized, that what would have they have done. Plus, it was open in the text, open opposition against the Pope. It would have been a messy, very interesting situation. But just, just to say, these are the facts. So it's clear that many people thought, well, it's not, it's not far from an agreement. But in reality, it has never been so far. Because once again, the text is one thing, this Condition sine qua non is another one, and the third is the canonical situation. Because once again, for us, we cannot be in any kind of situation. We cannot be in the hands of the bishops. It's impossible. We see with the Society of St. Peter, Christ the King, and so on, what happens to them. And I say that's the, one of the major problems for them, all the apostolate is depending on the bishops. And with this, the bishops, they can request from them what they want. And we know there are good people amongst these priests, but they are blocked. They cannot open the mouth. If they do so, it's finished. They have to go. That's why it's one of our first major requirements that we will have our own jurisdiction on the faithful. And amazingly, this point has been granted. Which means that our apostolate would be independent from the bishops. That's why in the conditions which we have posed uh, during the, the chapter, you find this point 
in the less important. It's one of the major, but as we got, already got it, we did not emphasize it, because we already have it, you see? It does not mean that it is less important. No, it's very important, major. If we don't have it, no way to, to go in. Uh, what else? I may say, here you already have the, the major, major points, the major line of what happened. It's not everything. There is something more confusing, which is, and what that, that's a point which was for me from the start, what does really the Pope want? If he says that he wants to recognize us, he cannot at the same time request from us the impossible. And we definitely, we definitely are opposed to these errors which we find in the Council. And we are not going to say it's okay. No. I concluded, and also, let's say, with all these people who were talking to me, that most probably the Pope was ready to downgrade at least a little bit the Council. To say, yes, it is true, the Council is not infallible, so you may discuss about these difficult points, as it seems that they said. And so when I got this letter, this new proposal from the 13th of June, I wrote a new letter to the Pope where I said that. I said, knowing, you know that we are opposed to the Council, and nevertheless that you want to recognize us, I had to conclude that you were, you were ready to put aside the problem. And I gave a historical example, because it's, it would not be the first time that would, have, that would have happened in the church. I gave the example of what happened in the decree of union with the Greek in the Council of Florence. In the Council of Florence, that is the, is the Middle Ages, well, the late Middle Ages, we'd say Renaissance, you had documents where the church did really manage to reunite the Greek, the Orthodox, and the Armenians. They did. You have the decree, they are signed. What happened then is when the people came back to, to the east, to Constantinople, to, to Russia, they were kicked out. They say the people refused what the, these uh, patriarchs had, had signed. But they did. And there is one point which is very interesting with the Greek, the Greek Orthodox. There was one point where they were not able to, be, to come in agreement. And it was about the marriage. The Orthodox say that if a part is in unfaithful in the marriage, this marriage can be annulled can be broken. The Catholic Church said, no, you can't do that. But they were not able to find an agreement. So what did they do? They made an agreement, dropping the case. They did not talk about the problem. If you read the decree on the Greek and the decree on the Armenians, you will see the difference, because with the Armenians, they mentioned the problem. But with the Greek, they just dropped it. And so I mentioned the case, and maybe that's what you do. You just leave the problem on the side in order to, to go ahead. Say, well, maybe that's what you want. And then I continue, but now, as you put these things again, I have to conclude that I was mistaken. I, so I write him, please tell us what you really think, what you want. I also ask, uh, request an audience, but uh, of course <laughs> this was not granted. But I got a letter, an answer to that. In, it's the first time that the Pope does answer me, anyway. And in this letter, which is dated from the 30th of June, you have these following points. First he says, I did agree that we change the text. Then he said, there are three points which you must accept so that you will be recognized. 
The first is that it is the magisterium which is the judge of what is traditional or not. And, well, that's true. That's a point of faith. So, But if we say yes, they will use it against us, of course. So it's dangerous. Second point. You must accept that the council is integrant part of tradition. That the Council Vatican II is traditional. Imagine, during 40 years, themselves have said the contrary. Now they say it's traditional. And we, we say, beg your pardon. We say, look at the reality. And the third point, you must accept that the new mass is valid and licit. But that point, I told them, well, we rarely use the word licit. We just simply say about the new mass that it is evil. And uh, that's the situation. Let's say with this clarification, things are clear, but everything is blocked. You say the I I still now wonder what we can do to to continue doctrinal discussions. Can we? Is it any any way possible? I still don't know. Well, I have some ideas, but everything is blocked. And you come now to a curious situation, which can be a little bit confusing, which can explain also what happened recently. You have the Pope who still, still would like to solve the problem. He can have many reasons. Uh, Some good, some less good. Some good is like, for example, to repair. He did say to one of his close people, you know, the society has suffered so many injustices, injustices. So they know, they know that they have been unjust with us. So to repair, that's fair. He wants to avoid a schism. He said it publicly. Not that we pretend, or that we don't. We, we we always claim that we are in the church. We don't want to make a schism. That they, they may have this fear that we would finally end up in a schism. That's possible on their side. Also, ecumenism is a possibility. It is trying to. <coughs> make easier the way for the Orthodox. Because the Orthodox, they look very closely at what is happening with us. You see, there is a kind of familiarity for them, for the Orthodox. Because they also, they want to stick to tradition. And if the Church is not able to arrange things with their, its own tradition, the Orthodox will say, well, if you are not able to do it with yourselves, you are not going to do it with us. So, in, on the contrary, you know, when the Pope greeted or uh, said, it's okay to say the old mass, the Patriarch of Moscow said, that's good. So he proved, he proved this, so to say, opening to tradition, which have the church. It's interesting to see these things. I don't see, say that it will go f- much further, but trying to, to, to understand why does the Pope want to do that. But, uh, so he wants that. Things are blocked. He nominated a prefect of the Congregation of the Faith who is very clearly opposed to us and strongly opposed to us. And so in order to, how do you say that, to balance the thing, he nominated another person who seems to be more open, who who wants to represent the position of the Pope, which makes it a little bit messy. And so when (coughs) Müller 
when Müller said, no, there's no discussion anymore with the society, the Pope was very angry, and he asked the number two to write a statement in which it is said, no, we have to be patient with the society, uh, uh, we want to continue the discussions and... Uh, In fact, they know that if my answers are considered as official, then the progressists will make pressure on them and say, well, now you have the answer, so... But as they would like, they still hope to, have, to get to a solution, they say, no, it's not official. I sent three times my answer. I don't know why it would, would not be official. But just to, to say, to relieve the pressure, they say, no, it's not official. I can, I can write it the first time. There's no problem for me. Uh, it's, it's really a curious situation. But we have to understand, it does not mean that we have changed anything. No, we maintain our point. The problem is in Rome, not in us. And the problem is that you have the modernists who would like to finish the story of the society with a condemnation. And you have some people who still hope that we'll get to something. I frankly don't know how it would be possible. For me, this situation now is really blocked. Really blocked. And the only way to solve that is to really... Well, what I already wrote in 2001. So it's not new. 2001, I wrote to Rome, you make the problem, you want to deal with this problem the wrong way. You have to change the status questionis. So it is, the status questionis is, you, you explain the problem. I say, you deal this problem wrong, the wrong way. And why? Why do I say so? How did we get into this thing? How did you come here? Because you were facing a reality. A reality which was unbearable. A reality you knew that if you would continue this way, you would hurt your soul. You would sin. You would hurt God. You say, no, I cannot do that. I have to stop there. I jump out of this. All of us, we are in that situation. <coughs> It's because of facts we are facing. Facts which come from the authorities in the church, which are unbearable. That's what I said to the Pope in the year 2005 during the audience. I told him, the situation of the church is such that the traditional life has been made impossible in the church. I told him, Every day, now, you have priests, you have religious sisters, brothers, you have laymen who come to us, who prefer to be punished, sanctioned, and join us rather to, than to stay in the situation in which they are. Because they have a problem of conscience, they can no longer go that way. And I said, if you want something, if you want to, to get back with us, you have to change that situation. You must bring back tradition in the church. And that's what I repeat today. That's what I say. I, I say to them, you cannot, in the name of the faith, oblige us to deny the reality. You cannot say, because the church cannot say anything wrong, there is nothing wrong in the council. Because the church cannot do anything wrong, the new mass is good. You say, look at the reality. It might be difficult to explain how this is possible, but the reality is there and it's not lying. The new mass is bad. The new mass is leading the souls in losing the faith. 
into Protestantism. It's clear, it's a fact. I told them, I told them, look, this is this liturgy which is making that the priests lose the faith in the real presence. And so many. You know their answer to me? They did not question the fact that priests have lost the faith. Because it's true. I have two figures, recent. First, a long time ago, I tried to calculate and say, mm, about 40% of the priests don't believe in the real presence. Now, last year, the vicar general of the Diocese of Trier in Germany said 80% of the priests in the diocese no longer believe in the real presence. And also recently there was a, an inquiry in the Diocese of Sydney, in the northern part of Sydney, inquiry to the priests. But the priests were able to, to answer anonymously, so they, were, they did not give their name. <coughs> 78% of the priests don't believe in the real presence. That's the reality. And I say to them, that the cause is the new mass. And they answer to me, no, 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 no. It's because they have been badly trained. But in fact, it's even worse. Because it means that their seminary was, was a tragedy. And which mass do they have at the seminary which badly trained them? The new mass. So you see, uh, what is going to happen in the future now, I don't know. I say be ready. It can be, can be um, yeah, again, we know that, uh, excommunication. Will it really happen or not? I think as long as the Pope is alive, I hardly believe it. But I really don't know if they manage to convince him that we are really against the council, could happen. I think it could happen. <coughs> and I may say, well, in any case, that's the way they treat us in any case. Now, already now, they treat us as excommunicated. That's the situation. So it doesn't change anything for us. So I say, don't fear. It's, uh, we know it. We know <laughs> what it means. And uh, I think that's not what is moving us. What is moving us is the salvation of the souls. We know that going the way the church goes now, thousands and millions of souls get lost. And that's what we don't want. That's what, why we want the church to come back to its tradition. And we know that one day it will happen. How, when, this is really not in our hands. We have to do our job, our duty. The rest is in the hands of God. Will it last long? Will it be short? I have some ideas. But they are pure opinion and perspective. What I see is that those who are really sticking to the council are those who made it and those who implement it. That means the, the older generation. Those who are in power now. But what I see also is that they are not followed. The younger generation, they don't follow that way. And it's very interesting I can understand that because they don't have this, uh, how do you say, uh, affective relation. The council for the younger generation is not their baby. The council for them, it's something which happened in the last millennium. So way in the past. What they see, what they experience is a disastrous situation of the church. A ruin. And they're not happy with that. They're frustrated. And so they try to look for something. And when they see, when they hear about tradition, they are very interested. And I see this already now. 
I can really tell you, you, we have priests in the modern who really are serious, really serious, and who want and who question the council. I got several messages of that type. Even more amazing, I saw somewhere a reflection. It was an English uh, pastor who said, that's amazing, but about half of the new seminarians, they have a relation with the old mass. And a French priest, modern, who said to him, well, you know, that's about the same in France. Well, in France, if you look at the situation now, this year, for example, 10% of the newly ordained French priest are of the society. The society is already representing today, if you look at the new ordination, 10% of all the ordination of France. If you add to this those who are ordained, let's say, for Ecclesia Dei and so on, you come to more than one-fourth, 25%. That means that the bishops are losing control on at, already now a quarter of the church in France. And their figures are dramatic. The average age in France for the priest is above 70. More than half of the priests in France are above 75. You can calculate as you want. In five years, that will mean that they are above 80. Because you have no younger coming. That means we are in front of a collapse of the church in France. It's so serious that the bishop have already prepared a shrinking of the dioceses for 2015 by one-third. One-third of France wiped out of the map. That's the situation. They are sterile. And I may say you find the same figures with a little bit of difference in time, a bit everywhere. Diocese of Rome. How many ordinations for the Diocese of Rome, priests from the place? How many? In one year? One. One only priest in the Diocese of Rome. Take Ireland. They have less than 10 seminarians for the whole island, new seminarians. We have more than them. This is the situation of the church. It's dying. And so you have, that's perfectly understandable. The younger generation, they, they are not happy with that. Of course they are not. And what is interesting we start to have now bishops. Bishops who think that we are right. They don't op open the mouth because it's too dangerous for them. They know that if they open the mouth, they will be decapitated. decapitated. But you know, it goes so far. One of these bishops directly asked me, he said, I want to say the mass, chant in mass every day, but if I do so, I will not be able to stay in my diocese. So what should I do? Stay in my diocese, trying to do some good there, or leave my diocese and say the giant in Mass? Well, I answered him, well, do both. That means say the Mass every day and stay in your diocese and try to do the good there. Big fight, but well, anyway. Uh, we have now a number of priests, of bishops. It's new. But it's real, it's true. Once again, they may not be courageous enough to, to speak out. It is true. Because the situation is still very, very difficult. But 
this is increasing. It's very interesting. They are not the majority, no. But if you compare five years ago, it's an enormous progress. And I find them a little bit everywhere. When Father Stelin uh, gave a conference in Rome last autumn, four bishops asked him to preach the retreat for their priests in their diocese. Seven of these bishops learned to say the Tridentine Mass. Some from Central America, some from Africa, some from Asia. It's coming little by little. It is coming. It's a big fight. And we are in this fight. And we, we must not abandon this fight. Of course, we must not burn ourselves. So we must be very, very prudent. No doubt about that. But we have to foster this movement. You see? This church is the Catholic Church. It's our church. It's sick full of sickness, yes, so be prudent. But we are not going to abandon the church, no. If someone is sick in your family, you don't say get lost. It's your father, he's sick, you take care of him. You don't let him say, I don't want to have nothing, anything to do with you, no. It's the same with the church. It's our church. It's sick. We pray for it. We do what we can. We try not to be burned once again. So we take our, our, our precautions. We must. There's no other way. Now when, when will, it, will the time come? This is very difficult to answer. I frankly, personally, I don't think that this is possible until the head is in our favor. Because the fight is too, too heavy. And the head, that means the Pope, must be absolutely convinced of the necessity of tradition. The fight might continue in the church, but as long as we don't have that, I don't see really any concrete, serious possibility to go ahead. Because it's too dangerous, too dangerous. We have many enemies, many enemies. But look, and that's very interesting. Who, during that time, was the most opposed that the church will recognize the society? the enemies of the church, the Jews, the Masons, the Modernists, the most opposed that the society would be recognized as the Catholic, the enemies of the church. Interesting, isn't it? More than that, what was the point? What did they say to Rome? They said, you must oblige these people to accept Vatican II. That's also very interesting, isn't it? People whom, from outside the church, who were clearly during centuries enemies of the church, say to Rome, if you want to accept these people, you must oblige them to accept the council. Isn't that interesting? Oh, it is. I think it's fantastic. Because it shows that Vatican II is their thing, not the churches. They see, the enemies of the church see their benefit in the council. Very interesting. So I may say that's the kind of argument we are going to use with Rome. Trying to make them reflect Trying to make them reflect. I say, the situation is not desperate. No. It's not worse than before. Still the same. There is some hope. 
I don't think for right for now, but for us, we just continue. This line, which has been so clearly given by Archbishop Lefebvre, which is so clear, this faithfulness to the past is so, so balanced and right. We see all these fruits. It's undeniable. So let's continue until better times. Now, how long will it last? I don't know. Some pretend that I said that I don't know in four years, I don't know how many years there will be an agreement. I have absolutely no idea. The only thing I say is first, agreement is not the right word, but recognition, normalization. We have a right, we are Catholics, and we have a right to that label. But that does not mean that we are going to change ourselves to get it. No. We know that this tradition is the future of the church. And so we must work that it comes back. Do what we can. We see that this influence of the tradition is gaining. Also, this is interesting. We are, we are making our point little by little. An example, look at this year. They tried to celebrate the 50 years of the council. Amazing to see how they feel obliged to justify themselves against our attacks. They didn't do that before. Now they feel obliged to justify. I'll give you another example, which is a little thing, but it was, uh, can tell something. You know that just before he became a pope, Benedict XVI gave the communion to a Protestant, to Roger Schütz. It was at the, at the funeral of John Paul II. Canal Ratzinger went and gave the communion to Roger Schütz of Thésée. Now, he said a little bit later on, he said to his, um, to his people, to his people who are close to him, what were his thoughts while he was giving the communion? And you know what? What was he thinking about when he was giving this communion to this Roger Schutz? He said to them, to his close people, I thought, what's the society going to say? So you see, we are in his mind. We are his conscience, his bad conscience. <laughs> it's very interesting, very interesting to see that. Because it shows that, let's say, we, so to say, we are, we are there. We, we are gaining in influence there. That does not mean that everything is fine. You probably heard these very last days, now they have decided to make Paul VI a blessed, to work for the beatification of Paul VI. That's unbelievable. Well, again, we protest against that. It's, well, the words are failing. It's so incredible. I give you just two facts, two facts. One, the tomb of the mother of Paul VI. And this is verified. So it's not hearsay. I did send someone to verify what I tell you now. And we took photos. The tomb of the mother of Paul VI is a Masonic tomb with all the Masonic symbols. It's a fact. How can a Pope allow his mother to have a Masonic tomb? Should help people to reflect. Another one, even more serious. He say, even more serious. And a Pius XII 
you know that you had the communist Russia who was persecuting the Catholics and suddenly someone said to the Pope you have a traitor in your house in the Vatican who is dealing with Moscow against you Pius XII did not want to believe it but the person who was the um, the Lutheran bishop of Helsinki gave the proof provided the proof to Pius XII these proofs were brought to the Pope by uh, I may say a secret agent he was a French military and we, we, this is all documented it's not hearsay and so the Pope got the proof that the traitor was the future Paul VI and when he knew that he kicked him out of the Vatican and he made him the Bishop of Milan and from there we got Paul VI after John XXIII and now they want to make him a blessed really you think but they, they have lost I don't know a lot of their mind it's incredible incredible my impression that they, they try they try to canonize to beatify all the popes who have brought in all these novelties why? because they know that they are at the end of their thing and they want to make it like a monument that will stay in the ages by canonizing all these things now that's my impression maybe I'm wrong but that's my impression once again why insisting in making all of them John XXIII Paul VI John Paul II all, all blessed why that if you start like that you can make saint everybody it's really they, they change they change the meaning of of holiness it, John Paul II explained that he said I want to make so many saints to, more, to show that the vocation to holiness is universal that means everybody is called to be a saint can be understood correctly but if you start to make everybody a saint uh, to canonize everybody there is something wrong somewhere <coughs> Well, just to show you that things are not well, let's say, if there is some hope somewhere, it's not, I am not optimistic on the situation. If you want another example, will, will we finish with this? An image of what kind of time do we have or are we in? At a certain moment, towards the end of winter, you see on the trees new buds. They just come out. It's a little thing there. When you see that, you know spring will come. But you start to say spring is there, the people will tell you, hey, come on, it's winter, it's freezing, it's snowing, it's icy, it's windy. Don't say it's spring, it's not true, it's winter. And they say both are right. It's still winter. And then they say if we look at the situation of the church, it is still winter. But we start to see these little signs which indicate that spring is coming. And now we have a very, very delicate moment. These buds, at a certain time, they have to come out. If they come out too quickly, they might be frozen. And the new flowers will be demolished. That's why we have to be very, very prudent before having these buds come out. But I may say that's precisely where we are now. In that very delicate time between I say between winter and spring there is hope for the church no doubt but 
don't be too optimistic, neither. And we must keep this very prudent balance, very prudent balance, trying to make things go forward, at the same time not pushing ourselves in it too far away and burning ourselves or killing ourselves. And so people who fear, I understand them, and say, but we're not going there. No, we are not. We, we don't want to demolish what we have done during 40 years. That would be crazy. So we want to be, and we are certainly prudent. We're not going to th throw ourselves in impossible situation. But um, we're still in the fight, that's all. And continue, continue to pray, to pray the Blessed Virgin Mary. The pray the rosary. It remains our, one of our main weapons. And of course, to continue to defend the faith. Not change. We have nothing to change. The faith is above time. What was true is true and will be true. We don't need to change anything there. And, well, one day the good Lord will put again order in his church. We must not forget that. It's his church. And he remains the boss. Our Lord is the boss. He is in control. This sometimes we forget. There is nothing happening in, on the earth that would be out of control. Our Lord dared to say there is not one air which is falling from our head without his permission. Not one air. So there is nothing happening on the earth, nothing evil which could happen without the permission of God. God is the master. You may wonder, but why does he, does he allow all these things? Well, he knows. He knows better than we why he does that. But what we must remember is that he did put us in that situation. And God, whenever he allows a temptation, a trial to happen, he provides the grace we need to face that situation, to win, to go through it, and not to fail. Remember that. We are in a difficult situation. Yes, it is true. Every day is hard. The, the world goes down. It's unbelievable what's happening there. Nevertheless, God allows that first. And while allowing that, he gives us what we need to be, to behave as Catholics today, to make our salvation today. Don't fear. On the contrary, count on him. But put the price. Pray. Do your duty of state. Be faithful to little things. And our Lord promised that he will, he will give us the grace we need to be faithful in the great things. He said it. And of course, go to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's clear that she has been given to us, especially for this time. She is our Heavenly Mother. There is a little phrase which is impressive in Fatima. God has put in her hands the peace of nations. She is really the queen, the queen of heaven and earth. Even the peace of nations is in the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Not to speak about the peace, um, uh, how do you say, the spiritual peace, the peace with God, the fight against the sin. And so really stay close to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And this time I promise I finish 
we will consecrate, we want to consecrate our society to Saint Joseph. Why? Because Saint Joseph is the patron of the church. He is the protector of the church. And remember in Fatima, that's also something very interesting. On the 13th of October, the Blessed Virgin Mary announced the miracle of the sun and she said that she would come to bless the earth with her son and with Saint Joseph. Saint Joseph was there with the child Jesus blessing the earth on when you had the miracle of the sun. So you have the Blessed Virgin Mary, you have the Immaculate Heart of Mary, yes, and that's the, I say, the first part or the, the essential of the message of Fatima, but you also have Saint Joseph. And so as he's the patron, the protector of the church, and as this time is so hard, we want to consecrate the society and, of course, all of you, all of us, to Saint Joseph. And so this consecration will happen on the 19th of March, which is the Feast of Saint Joseph. And so I invite all of you to, to prepare, to prepare that date, to prepare that consecration. We will, of course, provide with the necessary document for that, uh, for that great, great event. And so, well, in conclusion, the fight continues. I may say nothing new. Just the fight continues as, as ever before. And so let's finish by <coughs> entrusting ourselves to the Blessed Virgin Mary and I will give you the blessing. Salve Virginia.